There's a book that our prayer team has recently uh, been reading. It's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's written by Jim Cimbala. In the early 70s, Jim was starting out as a pastor. His small church building could only hold about 200 people, but barely 30 were present at any given Sunday. He felt severely underqualified for this position. His family was desperate financially, and the needs surrounding his church and community were overwhelming and suffocating. His wife, Carol, who did not know how to read sheet music, was leading the worship team behind the organ. Their building was falling apart. A pew actually collapsed in the middle of one of their services and had to stop and help the person up and move to another pew. The bills were greatly exceeding the giving and the community was extremely poor and filled with drugs and gangs. This is a quote from that book. Jim says, what we needed was a fresh wind and a fresh fire. We needed the Holy Spirit to transform the desperate lives of the people around us. One day I told the Lord that I would rather die than merely tread water throughout my career in ministry, always preaching about the power of the Word and the Spirit, but never seeing it. I abhorred the thought of just having more church services. I hungered for God to break through in our lives and ministry. And God did answer him not too long after that. God said to him very clearly, if your wife and you will lead my people to pray and call upon my name. You will never lack for something fresh to preach. I will supply all the money that is needed, both for the church and for your family. And you will never have a building large enough to contain the crowds that I will send in response. So Jim went back to his church, and he said, from this day on, the prayer meeting will be the barometer of our church. I'm going to say that again. From this day on, the prayer meeting will be the barometer of our church. What happens on Tuesday night will be the gauge by which we will judge success or failure because that will be the measure by which God blesses us. If we call upon the Lord, he has promised in his word to answer, to bring the unsaved to himself, to pour out his spirit among us. If we don't call upon the Lord, he's promised us nothing. Nothing at all. It's as simple as that, he says. No matter what is done elsewhere, any other ministries and all other efforts, the future will depend upon our times in prayer. This church is the Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York. It now has 16,000 members. And its choir is led by Jim, by Jim's wife, Carol. Still, she does not know how to read music. And their choir has won six Grammy Awards. God is good. It's not about the numbers that are there, but it's the fact that God fulfilled the promise to him. It's the fact that God's spirit, his presence, became present there. When they held him up, and had faith that he would hear them and answer them. He did not let them down. We're going to look at three facts about prayer here today. This is going to be a unique service. I am going to read from a scripture passage to kind of be our foundational point, but I'm going to make three points, and then we are going to embrace a time of prayer here today as well. And we're going to see how these three points are going to shape the future of our church. I might need a little help here with the first slide. So the passage is John 14, verse 12 through 14. 
This is Jesus right before he goes to the cross. This is the beginning of his farewell address, meaning right before he goes to the cross. This is the stuff that he covers with his disciples at the end. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whether you ask, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So the first point here that I want to make that really does go outside of this particular scripture passage but is important for us to know is that our weakness, our weaknesses make room for prayer. When all is great in our life, we don't feel like we need God. And that goes for Christians and non-Christians. You hear people, can I pray for you? No, I'm good. Things are good right now. We all do it, right? I don't need any prayer. We all always need prayer. Always. Always. Because the day that God stops intervening is the day when we are all in trouble. We were created to walk with God and to know Him. It's only when we truly realize that there's nothing that I can do to change this situation our helplessness, our futility in our efforts, when they become obvious that we finally reach to the only one who really truly has the power to do what is needed. So ultimately, times of despair allow God to reveal himself in much more powerful ways than ever before. Because we realize if something does happen, only he could be the one that had done it. The same way that he said to Gideon, right? Gideon had all these warriors with him. And God says, I want you to narrow it down to 300. To take on many thousands. And Gideon's like, what? I have a whole bunch of people, many more than 300. Why are you whittling it down to 300? And what does God tell him? Because I know otherwise you will try and take all the glory. You won't give me credit. We all are like that. It's important for us to see the hopelessness of our situation if God doesn't intervene. Some don't want to inconvenience God, but this is a deception. I don't want to bother him. Well, first of all, he's not like us. So he's not going to get overwhelmed or stressed out just because you added to his schedule for the day. He can handle it. And I think him sending Jesus also, Jesus himself being God, the fact that he came and died for our sins and rose from the grave, I think is a huge testimony to the fact that God wants to get involved. But his work doesn't do anything for us if we don't accept it, if we don't reach for him. He reaches out to us. We need to reach for him. That's what prayer also is, is us reaching back to him. So the second point is it's an honor to be able to pray for ourselves and for others, to have that opportunity to cry out to God and to have him hear us. The Psalms talk about this all the time. David says, when I cry out to God, you will hear me. And he basically is telling his enemies, beware, because I'm bringing the big big guns in. When I cry out to God, he will hear me, and I know it. Because I walk with him, I know him, I follow him, I love him, and he loves me. We were separated in the garden because of sin, and Jesus is the bridge that brings us back to that unified place. We're given grace, something we don't deserve. Reinstatement is a priesthood, holy, 
a holy nation in all of this world, a kingdom of priests that walk on this earth, and priests intercede for other people. They pray to God. Those rescued from the darkness are the best ones to speak into the darkness and to illuminate who God is. That's why we don't get taken back up as soon as we accept Christ. And he says, okay, now you have eternal life. There's still work to be done here. There's still a lot of people that are lost here. And there's still things that as we walk with God that he transforms us also. It's in our times of need that we realize we need him. And we reach out to him. We learn to walk with him. We get the opportunity to see the living God listen to what we are saying and act. Amen? It is an honor to serve the living God and to know him. But we only get better at praying by praying. When we say, I know when I first, when I first started going to seminary even, my mom is a great prayer. I'd listen to her pray all the time and be like, wow, I can never pray like that. She would say, do you want to pray? No. <laughs> you pray. You do it much better than I do. But as time goes on, you get better at it. You know, it starts off very simple. God doesn't look for, wow, this one's a really good praying person. I'm going to answer his prayer. This other one needs some work. We'll wait a little while before we answer that prayer. The scripture tell us that the Holy Spirit knows the cries of our hearts, even when we don't even have the words to say what we want to say, when we don't even know what we're asking for, we just, the tears just come down. And we just say, help, help me. It's all he's looking for. That's actually a pretty good prayer. Therefore, we're not going to give out lists at our prayer team anymore. We used to give out lists. We used to send them out email-wise. It's an honor to intercede for other people. And if God puts something on your heart, yes, we should all come together and pray for him. We'll still have our phone chain prayer that will go out and people that need prayer that we will be praying together. But come our, where you have our Thursday night prayer meetings. My encouragement is if there's someone that is on your heart, then get there and be praying for them with the rest of the church as well. Those prayer meetings will be where we will announce who needs prayer, but there will be no lists that are given out for you to take home. You can write down your own list if you want, but we should be praying for the ones that God puts on our hearts. And there are going to be people that when they're called out, that they will be on our hearts, and we will be praying for them all week long. We want, we might still list as far as in the bulletin, I have a list of people that we want you to continue to be lifting up, but the prayer meetings, no. We want those to be things that we come together and we pray for. If we struggle it aside and just say, can you guys pray for this person? We're treating an honor that God gives us with contempt, that it's no big deal. God has put this person in my heart, but... I have other things to do. He says, you have, I've given you an honor to pray to me and I will listen to you. When you cry out to me, I will hear you. And if you don't believe that, I encourage you to come to those prayer meetings and you will see it. I guarantee you. Jesus says that in our text, all who follow him will do as he did. They will pray, they will heal, they will teach, they will guide others to the Lord. Isn't it interesting that Jesus prays to the Father? He is God, and he prays to the Father. That's really interesting, because he's an example for humanity as to how we were meant to live. He even gets to a point where if he's getting too overly worked, he says, you know what? I need to go out by myself and spend time in solitude alone with God because I'm getting too overwhelmed. I need to spend time alone with God. We need to do the same thing. Jesus prays to God the Father. And if him, as the Son of God, does it, that should tell us what we need to do. We need to be doing it as well. 
Because of Jesus, our ministries will have the ability to be more fruitful. Because of what Jesus did at the cross, he gives us the ability to have the honor of praying to the living God. That's why when he says, "You will follow, those who follow me, who believe in me, will do things that I have done, and they will even be greater things that you do. The reason is because we have the Holy Spirit now in us and around us. You remember throughout the Gospels that, that we've been talking about that Jesus is doing all these things and the disciples are blind. They can't see it. They don't understand it. They don't have the Holy Spirit working in them yet. Once Jesus dies and goes to, and ascends up to heaven, now the Holy Spirit will be in us, around us, and there will be the ability for us to do things that Jesus even was not able to do because the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. He says, it's better for me to go so that the other can come in my place. We have an honor that has been given to us. It is an honor to serve the living God and to know him. And the third point, as children of God, our prayers and our actions around prayer should reflect and glorify him. Jesus says twice in our text that those who ask in my name, in my name will be empowered and answered. This means as his representatives and in his likeness. A name represents the quality of a person, the nature of a person. So in my name, when he says in my likeness, when you pray to me in my likeness, I will answer you. We need to know what his likeness is. That's what the church is for us, to teach us those things. We know that a person who is deliberately going against God's word will not be healed. I think the scriptures are very clear on that. A person that is deliberately sinning against God will not have their, answer, their prayer answered. He will not listen to them who rebel against him. That's, so isn't it better for a person, if they're in that situation, for us to be, instead of praying about what they need, what do they need more than anything? What they need is to turn back to God and repent and be healed. Because if we're missing that element, we're praying a prayer that is not in the name of Jesus. It's not in his likeness at all. All that Jesus did, he turned people back to God in love, but sometimes it hurt a little bit. But he would tell them, he would say to them, turn back to God, be healed, embrace the light, follow me. Everything he said and did illuminated a path that was to life. If we are simply doing it just because it's robotic, let me pray for you. Well, what do you need prayer for? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you? Do you know what that means? Then let us pray. And God will heal you. He will answer you. He will be there for you. Children of God are light to this world and so to direct others to his grace. You need to remember that and be praying for those things, truly, uh, for the people that we pray for, that we intercede for. If we're a kingdom of priests, we need to act like it. Then also, at the same point, others would see their presence of God in their lives. When we pray for people and prayer is answered, they will see that what it is that we are guiding them into, it works. So in conclusion... What does that say about a church which is filled with people praying to God? What does that say to everyone? Those that are attending, those that are looking from the outside in, does it not show incredible faith in Jesus and that God exists? He hears and he will answer us. It screams out, this is where our hope is coming from as we cry out to God. To not use what God gives us is a testimony that we don't believe that it really makes any difference either way. There are more important things to do. 
This was the first ministry that I established when I came here. There was no other ministry. That was the first thing that we established. Because in my mind, if we don't have that going, everything else is futile. Everything else is just going through the motions. Prayer is first, most important, by far. Our prayer meetings are going to start back up this week. Um, this Thursday, is uh, every Thursday is when they, they operate. We used to hold them at 515. Uh, We're going to push them back later. So for those of you that work, are not able to be able to make it, 7 o'clock is when we'll end up having them. We're going to hold them up here also because the youth group is going to be meeting also at the same point at the same time. Um, so uh, regardless, we will have our prayer meeting uh, on Thursday nights, 7 p.m. up here. We will have something, it'll look something like that we will have a time of celebration, of praise. Could be in singing, could be just in praising God, of saying what he's done and, and answers of prayer that have happened just recently. It could be um, uh, after, after that then we'll, grow, we'll split up into, uh, into groups, smaller groups, if we have a bigger group of people then, maybe three to five people or so. Um, lists will not be handed out. They will be read off as to people that are in need of prayer. And then we will just allow these groups to be able to pray out loud to God and to raise their hands up to Him and to ask Him to intervene in the lives uh, of this church and of these people and to allow our hearts to be poured out to God. So today we're going to do that. We're going to do it right now. We are going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, maybe a little longer, and we're going we're gonna to reach out to God. We're going to pray to Him. I'm going to lift up certain issues. I'm going to introduce an issue. I'm going to say that um, this is an issue that, uh, that we want to hold up for an example. Uh, we want to pray for our community, for our, um, our nation, and for our world. And I'll give a few minutes and be silent. And you pray as you feel called. If you feel silent prayer, that's fine. But I encourage you to just, to just pray. And it doesn't have to be eloquent. It can be choppy. It can be filled with tears. It can be whatever. It doesn't have to be smooth at all. Uh, and it definitely doesn't have to be long either. But we'll pray. We'll pour out our hearts to God. And then we'll move to the next subject. And before we do that, I just I want to say this, that is, to conclude this sermon part, is, as Jim Cimbala said, from this day on, the prayer meeting will be the barometer of our church. What happens on Thursday nights will be a gauge by which we will be judged, our success or our failures, because that will be the measure by which God blesses us. It shows our faith, where our faith is. Do we reach up to God? I don't think anybody is in a place right now that could say that they're good. They don't need any help. If we know that that's where the power of God stems from, then why would we not all be flocking to it? Amen? The proposition of the statement here is exactly that. Pray because Jesus has empowered us and instructed us to do so. So let us pray here today. Father God.